I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die um, Good evening, welcome to Bookshop West Portal My name is Susan Tunis, I am delighted any time that I have to scurry about before an event putting out extra seats uh, that's a success in my opinion I'm so happy to see you all here and thank you for joining me in welcoming our friend and neighbor dr. Robert Lustig to bookshop West portal um, I'm thrilled that we are uh, having dr. Lustig and to introduce him I am going to have Tucker Hyatt the executive director of Wonderfest come up thank you All right, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, I want to add a little personal note here. I uh, am excited as the Wonderfest director of a Bush Bookshop West Portal fan to have him here, but I'm also glad because I can thank him personally. In fact, I already did. Um, Dr. Lustig's <laughs> research and his advocacy have already, in a modest way, but important way, affected my life, improved my life. And I have a feeling he can do that for a lot of people. Robert Lustig is professor of pediatrics in the Division of Endocrinology at UC San Francisco. He is a member of UCSF's Institute for Health Policy Studies, and he directs UCSF's WATCH program. That's Weight Assessment for Teen and Child Health WATCH. A native of Brooklyn, New York, Dr. Lustig earned his MD from Cornell University Medical College. He completed his clinical fellowship at UCSF, cementing his fondness for the Bay Area, I suspect, where he does reside today. Dr. Lustig has authored more than 120 peer-reviewed articles and has written five popular books. The most recent is The Hacking of the American Mind, the science behind the corporate takeover of our bodies and our brains. Please join me in welcoming and maybe even thanking Dr. Robert Lustig. This, <clears throat> this is your last chance. <laughs> After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill, you wake up in your bed tomorrow morning, and everything will be the same. <laughs> you take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. <laughs> All I'm offering you is the truth, nothing more. So said Morpheus in the Matrix. <laughs> That's why I'm wearing black. <laughs> Did my best. I'm not as handsome as Lars Fishburne, but you know, it is what it is. First of all, thank you, Tucker, and thank you, Susan, and thank all of you for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, you're going to see why I started with that, because um, what we're going to talk tonight about is the new alt-reality that has been created for us that we don't even know about. And I'm going to try to explain how we got there and ultimately how we can get out. So, first of all, I do have a couple of disclosures. Uh, I did write these two books, one we're talking about tonight. I am the chief science officer of a nonprofit called Eat Real, which uh, certifies restaurants and teaches nutrition education to children because 33% of Americans don't know how to cook, and if you don't know how to cook, you're hostage to the food industry for the rest of your life. So we are teaching fourth graders to cook. And also, I am the chief medical officer of a for-profit company called Slendine. One thing that Tucker didn't mention is that I actually retired clinically from UCSF uh, six weeks ago, in part because of the book. So to devote more time to research, to policy, and to try to, you know, get an answer to what ails us. So um, I'm still at UCSF, but I have these other responsibilities and jobs now, too. All right, so let's start with this. Anybody know who this is? Yes. His name is Zeke Emanuel. Ever heard of him? Mm -hmm. So he's an uh, ethicist and oncologist at the University of Pennsylvania. He also happens to be Rahm Emanuel's brother, mm -hmm. and he also happens to be the architect of Obamacare. Which, amazingly, is still with us. Um, and he wrote this article in The Atlantic back in uh, 
2014, called Why I Hope to Die at 75. I don't know about you, but I really don't hope to die at 75, and I would hope you guys wouldn't either. Basically, he had to justify Obamacare in the fact that 50% of all medical care is spent in the last month of life, and, you know, there are clearly uh, exorbitancies within the system. But the question was, how to sell Obamacare to the public? Ultimately, Obamacare was predicated on a premise. The premise was that we could put 32 million sick people onto the rolls, and we could do it by providing preventative services. That is, by being able to see your doctor, by being able to access medicines, you wouldn't have to go to the emergency room where the cost is 50 to 100 times greater, and that we would ultimately see that savings that would be translated into health care for everybody. That's what Obamacare said. So we get this instead. The government can't make me buy health insurance, and why would I when I can just go here and you'll pay for it? That's kind of where we are today. Well, in fact, after Obamacare, we did not see that. We actually saw an uptick in ER visits, and in fact, Healthcare plans in 2016 increased their premiums by 25%, and they're about to do it again. And three of the major carriers, United, Aetna, and uh, uh, Humana, left the exchanges because they couldn't make any money. Therefore, why should they participate? So this is not the way to give health care for all. And I don't care whether you like Obamacare or not. The question is, was the premise correct? Well, this is what we almost got. Okay, this is Trump care. Have diabetes, Trump's budget director says you brought it on yourself, so like the soup Nazi, no health care for you. Okay, that's where we are. Okay. So the problem is that Obamacare and to be honest with you, all health care in America is based on two falsehoods, two inconvenient truths which I'm going to share with you right now. You probably know them, but you know, it's good to see them outlined. There is no medicalized prevention for chronic metabolic disease. There's just treatment. And treatment costs a boatload. And the pharmaceutical companies know that, which is why they've all diverted all of their resources to coming up with new chronic disease drugs. That's why we don't even have antibiotics anymore. Because the pharmaceutical companies aren't interested in antibiotics because you can't make enough on treating somebody for 10 days for an infection. But boy, oh boy, can you make money for 20 years? You darn tootin' you can. Second, you can't fix health care until you fix health. And you can't fix health until you fix diet. And you can't fix diet until you know what's wrong. And we don't. The question is, did we ever? Well, this is from 1984. Some of you might remember this famous Time magazine cover about cholesterol. Okay? What do you all think of cholesterol? Good, so bad, good. indifferent. So bad. Got a, the thumbs down over there, okay? I'm not letting you near Facebook. <laughs> but this is what happened instead when we went low fat. We got this instead, okay? And this was back in 2001, 6 million kids. Now we have 22. Okay? With all of, you know, the, the, the hype and with all of the health care and with all of the research and with Michelle Obama's vegetable gardens, 22 million. Okay. Here's the problem. This is the fiction. Okay. Uh, who watches football? <laughs> Only one person? <laughs> Are you two? We got two people who watch football. Gosh. <laughs> Chronic traumatic encephalopathy, everybody stopped, is that it? Okay. This was Coca-Cola's coming together campaign. It was on every football game. It was a two-minute video. You can watch it right now, don't. Okay, but this is a direct quote from that video. And it says, beating obesity will take action by all of us based on one simple common sense fact. All calories count, no matter where they come from, including Coca-Cola and everything else with calories. So, 
You can get your calories from carrots, or you can get your calories from cheesecake, or you can get your calories from Coca-Cola, or you can get your calories from kumquats. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Because if you eat more than you burn, you will gain weight. If you eat less than you burn, you will lose weight. Therefore, it's about energy balance. It's about calories in and calories out. Therefore, it is about two behaviors. It is about gluttony and sloth. Therefore, if you're fat, it's your fault. Therefore, don't blame us. Blame yourself. Therefore, any calorie can be part of a balanced diet. Therefore, don't look at our calories. Go pick on somebody else's calories. All of that <laughs> comes from this notion that calories are fungible. That you know, one calorie is like any other calorie, because it's a calorie is a calorie. And after all, it is common sense. Well, I don't believe in common sense. I believe in science. I believe in data. In fact, Tucker and I were just talking about the UCSF motto, in God we trust, everyone else has to produce the data. <laughs> okay? Which is why UCSF is the best hospital on, in California, because we actually live and breathe that. And I'm proud to be a, a, a part of it. Now, here are the people who are saying this. Okay? And you recognize all of them, don't you? Okay? If a food has a logo, it's been processed. This is the processed food industry. Who is saying a calorie is a calorie? And the question is, why are they saying that? And is it true? So, they say it's about calories. They say it's about obesity. You get fat, you get sick. That's what they say. Is it true? Is that true? So over here we have a scattergram with all the countries in the world. Obesity prevalence here on the x-axis. Diabetes prevalence over here on the y-axis. And you would look at this and you'd say, well, very clearly, Dr. Lustig, there is a correlation. Yes, there is. Indeed, there is a correlation. I don't argue that. But correlation is not concordance. They're not the same. Because we have countries that are obese without being diabetic, such as Iceland, Mongolia, Micronesia. And we have countries that are diabetic without being obese, such as India, Pakistan, and China. India and China today have an 11% diabetes prevalence. They're thin. We, the fattest nation on earth, have a 9.4% diabetes prevalence. If it's about calories or obesity, how come they have more diabetes than we do? Problem number one. Problem number two. Obesity is increasing worldwide at the rate of 1% per year. Yet diabetes is increasing worldwide at the rate of 4% per year. If diabetes is just a subset of the larger group of obese persons, then how do you explain that? Well, uh, you can't because... Uh, <laughs> It ain't so. <laughs> and here's some more data. Number three. Over here we have the secular trend in diabetes in the United States over a 25-year period. This is the total here. And we're going to look at this side over here because this is stratified by BMI. So here we have the obese people, BMI over 30. Here we have the overweight people, 25 to 30. And here we have the normal weight people, 25 and under. Everybody with me? And you would look at this and you say, well, very clearly there's been a 25% increase in the prevalence of obesity over the course of time, except that there's also been a 25% increase in the prevalence in normal weight people as well over that same period of time. So if the normal weight people are getting diabetes just as fast as the obese people, then how can it be about obesity? So here's the nugget of truth in all of this. This is a Venn diagram of the entire United States population. 240 million adults, okay? 30% obese, BMI over 30. 70% normal weight, BMI under 30. Everyone in this room is in one of the two circles, okay? They are mutually exclusive circles. So far, so good. The standard mantra from the doctors and the dietitians and the NIH, and the Institute of Medicine, and the Surgeon General, and the White House, and Congress, and the food industry, is the following. 80% of those obese individuals 
they're sick. They're metabolically ill. They're fat, and they're sick, and they're sick because they're fat. And if we could only just get them to diet and exercise, we could solve this problem. That's what they said. That's what Trump's budget director said. Garbage. Total, complete trash. How come? Sounds right. Common sense. Garbage. It's on the slide. It's on the slide. It is true that 80% of obese people are metabolically ill. I don't argue that. That's true. But that means that 20% are not. They're metabolically healthy. We actually have a name for them. They're called MHO, metabolically healthy obese. We study them to try to figure out how come they didn't get sick. They will live a completely normal life, die at a completely normal age, not cost the tax paradigm. They're just fat. Conversely, 40% of the normal weight population have the exact same diseases for the same reasons as do the obese. They're just not obese. Normal weight people get type 2 diabetes. Normal weight people get hypertension. Normal weight people get lipid problems, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia. They get all the same chronic metabolic diseases as do the obese. Now, they get it at a lower prevalence. I don't argue that. 40% versus 80%. So, no question, obesity is a risk factor. That's true. But it's not a cause. Because if normal weight people get it too, then how can it be a cause? And when you do the math on 40% of 70% of 168 million, there are 67 million thin sick people compared to the 57 million fat sick people. There are more thin sick people than fat sick people. But they're blaming the fat sick people. <laughs> and when you do the math on the two of them together, it's more than half the US population, which is what makes it a public health crisis, because anyone can get it. And that's not what they're saying. But that's the truth. So if you don't get that, nothing else I'm going to talk about is going to make any sense. But that's the truth. And I can prove it. So here we have, uh, any radiologists in the room? Yeah. Oh, one. Okay, good. Good. You shut up. <laughs> they let everybody else guess, right? Uh, here we have two equally weighted people. Okay, trunk fat 12.8. Notice, okay? One of these guys is healthy. One of these guys is sick. Which one's sick? A or B? B. B. I hear a B. Do I hear an A? A. Turns out it's B. B. A, he's just got big love handles. Something to hold on to in bed at night. This guy down here, he's got fat around his organs. Okay? Visceral fat. Okay? That big belly fat as opposed to big butt fat. But actually, we now have more data that's been developed over the last five years, that it's not even the visceral or the belly fat, and I'll show you why. So here we have what's known as an MRI fat fraction map. So here's an obese person. You can see the love handles over there on the side. But what I want you to look at is this guy's liver right there, nice and dark. Very little fat, 2.6%. That's fine. This is an MHO, metabolically healthy obese. Nothing wrong with this guy. Here's what you would normally expect to see. So, obesity, now take a look at this guy's liver fat, 24%. This guy's got non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This guy's got metabolic syndrome. This guy gonna die. And then you have this guy over here, who is thin, notice, not much in the way of fat packs over there. But take a look at his liver. Oops, there you go. 23%. He's just as sick as this guy. Thin sick, fat sick, fat healthy. So the question is, what's going on? So we have a name for this. I'll take it back, I forgot to mention. Okay. It's called TOFI, T-O-F-I, 
Sit on the outside, fat on the inside, real medical terms, swear to God, 1,500 Medline citations. <laughs> Coined by Dr. Jimmy Bell, a neuroimager at University College London. Okay? So my question to you right now, all of you, are you a TOFI? Do you know? How would you know? How would you know? Would your doctor know? How would he figure it out? Would he have to stick you in a scanner to find out? So this is the question. And the problem is, there are a whole bunch of TOFIs making fun of everybody else. <laughs> and that's not okay. So, you get the picture. In fact, this whole blow-up over cholesterol created this. It has now been rescinded by the group that espoused it, the American Heart Association. Ron Krauss, who crossed the way, way at uh, Children's Oakland Research Institute, head of the nutrition committee of the American Heart Association, has said, we screwed up. We got it wrong. They've been walking it back, slowly, but they've been walking it back ever since. So this is kind of interesting. Notice, who wrote this report? Credit Suisse, <laughs> an international global investment bank. Their job is to make money. That's their job, right? What are they doing with diet? Because this affects everybody. This affects healthcare costs. This affects economic productivity. This affects products. This affects food. So they weighed in with a clear eye, with no bias. And they just looked at the data. And here's what they came up with. And by the way, I had nothing to do with this report. Nothing whatsoever. This is what they said. A high intake of omega-6 fats and vegetable oils has not been proven to be beneficial for our health, and trans fats have been shown to have negative health effects. The higher intake of vegetable oils and the increase in carbohydrate consumption in the last 30 to 40 years are the two leading factors behind the high rates of obesity and metabolic syndrome in the U.S., Saturated and monounsaturated fats are not. An international global investment bank knows more medicine than the doctors. Because this is absolutely the God's honest truth. They got it right. Because they looked at the data. All right? The question is, who's not? And the answer is, all of us. All of us. This is another paper that just came out very recently, and I wanted to point out the three people who wrote this. Asim El Hotra is a member of the NHS Health Trust in London. Rita Redberg, here at UCSF, is the editor-in-chief of JAMA Internal Medicine, not exactly a lightweight publication. And Pascal Meyer, who's the editor of BNJ Open Heart, wrote, Saturated fat does not clog the arteries. Coronary heart disease is a chronic inflammatory condition, the risk of which can be effectively reduced from healthy lifestyle interventions. And they specifically say that insulin resistance and systemic inflammation, which is the driver of these chronic metabolic diseases, type 2 diabetes, are due to excessive sugar and refined carbohydrate. Just what Credit Suisse said. So there are doctors who get it. The question is, does your doctor get it? What have you been told for the last 40 to 50 years? What have you practiced? Have you benefited from it? Do you feel like maybe your brain has been hacked? We wrote a paper in response to all of this. This is Asim and myself and uh, Marianne Damasi, a rheumatologist researcher from Australia. The cholesterol and calorie hypotheses are both dead. It's time to focus on the real culprit, insulin resistance. That's exact. I mean, I wrote it, so it better be right. Okay. But that's the point. We have gotten this all wrong. All of it. And we have the data. We have the proof. Some of you may have heard about this study that we did here at UCSF in our, out of our obesity clinic. We took 43 kids with metabolic syndrome. That is, <coughs> obesity plus at least one comorbidity. So, metabolically ill children. Latino and African American. So, low SES status. And what we did was we figured out what they were eating at home. And we studied them on their home diet. And then for the next nine days, we catered their meals. 
no added sugar. We took the sugar out of their diets. Now, if you take that much sugar out of kids' diets, their calorie content of their diet is going to go down by 350 to 400 calories a day, in which case then they would lose weight, and then people would say, well, of course they got better, they lost weight. So we couldn't let them lose weight. So we had to substitute the number of calories we were taking out of sugar and substitute something else that was equivalent, starch. We gave them polymerized glucose instead of glucose fructose. Glucose fructose is sugar, the sweet stuff. Polymerized glucose is starch, like bread, po rice, pasta, potatoes. So, in the vernacular, we took the pastries out, we put the bagels in. We took the sweetened yogurt out, we put the baked potato chips in. We took the chicken teriyaki out, we put the turkey hot dogs in. Everybody got it? Okay. And we gave them a scale. And they went home every day and they weighed themselves. We called them up on the phone, what'd you weigh? And if they were losing weight, eat more! <laughs> to keep their weight stable. And then we brought them back 10 days later, and we did all the studies all over again to see what had happened to them at the same weight. Everybody got that? We were very interested in the liver fat in particular. Okay, and what we found was that here at baseline, the liver was making liver fat out of the sugar, and that was causing fatty liver and it was causing VLDL, which is their serum triglyceride, which is more dangerous than LDL. Everybody's been focused on LDL, and the reason we've been focused on LDL is because we have a medicine for that. Don't take that. Not because it's the right particle, but because ah, we had a medicine for it, called statins. Okay, triglycerides are actually worse. The relative risk, the hazard risk ratio for LDL is 1.3, the relative, the hazard risk ratio for triglycerides is 1.8. So 50% more dangerous than LDL. But we didn't have a medicine for it. Okay. And so they're making triglyceride, they're making VLDL triglyceride out of the sugar. That's the sugar made that gets converted to fat in the liver through a process called de novo lipogenesis new fat making. This is how your liver handles excess sugar. We took away the sugar for nine days, adding starch back in, and what we found was, where, where'd it go? There's a, oh, anyway, there, there's supposed to be a, a liver down there. <laughs> it disappeared with um, no fat in it and the triglycerides going away. And what we were particularly interested in was which fat depots changed in this paradigm because the weight didn't change. So the subcutaneous fat, the big butt fat, didn't change because the patients didn't lose weight. The visceral fat, the big belly fat, went down 7% in 10 days, and the liver fat went down 22% in 10 days with no change in calories and no change in weight. And their metabolic health improved, their metabolic syndrome actually reversed in 10 days flat off the charts. And we were the lead article in gastroenterology last month. Oh, there it is. <laughs> okay. All right. Like that. Okay. Um, and here's the thing that just burns me up the most. This whole fat thing was a put up job. It was a fraud. All of it. Fifty years of low fat because the sugar industry needed to exonerate their product. My colleagues at UCSF, Kristen Carnes, Laura Schmidt, and Stan Glantz, you may know Stan's name, he's Mr. Anti-Tobacco, I think he's spoken here himself, okay, unearthed the paper trail of two articles that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1967 published by the chairman of nutrition of the Harvard School of Public Health, Fred Stair, and his assistant, Mark Hegstead, who became the head of the USDA in 1970. And it turned out they singled out fat and cholesterol as the dietary cause of heart disease and downplayed the evidence that sucrose, or sugar consumption, was also a risk factor. The Sugar Research Foundation set the review's objective, contribute articles for inclusion, and receive drafts. The SRF's funding and role were not disclosed. The whole thing's a fraud. Everything you knew, or you thought you knew, for the last 50 years about nutrition, diet, and health has been a fraud. 
Do you feel hacked? We have the paper trail. We have the data. We have the proof. This isn't like made up stuff. Okay? And we're now all sick as hell because of it. Now, here's where processed food entered the equation in 1965. We're going to come back to this uh, slide in a couple of minutes. Okay? But you can see, we went from four pounds of sugar per year to 120 pounds. Right now we're at 94 pounds of sugar per year. Point is, we should be at about 20. So we're about four times too high. Okay. Oh, sorry. And what I want to show you is this, I don't know what happened, but this is the, um, it's supposed to be down here, something happened. But anyway, this is the percent of GDP spent on health care for the same period of time. What you can see is that in 1965, things started going up with the advent of processed food. This is a processed food phenomenon. And processed food is high sugar, low fiber. High sugar for palatability, low fiber for, sh for shelf life and storage. Okay? And when we took the fat out of the food, the food tasted terrible. So what did they do? Add more sugar. And now we're all obese, diabetic, with metabolic syndrome, heart disease, and cancer and dementia, which we now are gathering the data. I'm giving a talk in Reno at the Nevada Cancer Symposium on Monday on sugar metabolic syndrome and cancer. We actually now have the basic science mechanism by which sugar causes cancer. Causes. Not associated. Causes. As of, what, two weeks ago. So let's just do the math on this. The food industry grosses $1.4 trillion a year, of which $657 billion is gross profit. That's a gross profit margin of 45%. The next highest uh, industry is Big Pharma at 18%. Think about that. 45%, 18%. Okay? This is a juggernaut. This is a non-stop gravy train. And they do not want to give it up. Here's the problem. Healthcare costs in the U.S. total $3.2 trillion a year, of which 75% is chronic metabolic disease, the diseases we've been talking about, of which 75% of that is preventable if we could go back to rates from 1970, before all this broke, you know, all, the, all hell broke loose. That means 75% of 75% of 3.2 trillion, that's $1.8 trillion a year going down a rat hole. What do you think we could do with $1.8 trillion a year? Anything? Hmm? <laughs> yeah, you could have a tax cut. <laughs> if you could save that, couldn't you? Yeah, you could really have a tax cut. All right. You get the idea. We lose triple what the food industry makes cleaning up their mess. That's unsustainable. You can't do that. And that's why Medicare and Social Security are going broke. And that's why neither Obamacare, nor Trump care, nor any care will ever fix this. You can't fix it unless you fix diet. And they don't want diet fixed. We have computed using something called advanced Markov modeling, how much money the United States would save in terms of fatty liver disease, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, overweight and obesity, if we could reduce our consumption by 20% here in blue or 50% here in red, going out to the year 2035. That's pretty good. $31.8 billion a year over here. Now, Social Security. Okay, who here collects Social Security? You know it's a Ponzi scheme, right? Yes. You know that, right? The only difference between Bernie Madoff and Social Security is like who holds the money in the meantime, right? You know that. Okay. Now, for a Ponzi scheme to work, okay, the young, healthy people down here at the bottom of the pyramid have to pay in so that the old, infirm people at the top can take out. That's the way it works. Everybody got that? But what happens if the young people are not healthy. What if they're not paying in? In fact, what if they're so unhealthy that they're taking out because they're on dialysis for their type 2 diabetes when they're 35? Then what? 
the entire pyramid collapses. And that's what we are seeing. And in fact, Social Security will be broke by the year 2029. Okay, and I can prove it because this is from the Congressional Budget Office, and here's 2029 falling off a friggin' cliff. Now, I'm going to be 72 years old in 2029, and I want my friggin' Medicare and Social Security. Because I worked hard for it. Presumably, you worked hard for it, too. Okay, it won't be there. It won't be there for you, it won't be there for me, and it certainly won't be there for your children. Because of this. Are you mad yet? It's even worse than that. Okay? Like, you know, if you're mad now, wait till you see this. Okay, this is from Morgan Stanley, another international global investment bank whose job is to make money. Okay? And they looked at this question as well in a different way. They looked at economic growth over here on the y axis against time modeling forward by 20 years to the year 2035 based on a low sugar case, which we don't have here in blue, versus a high sugar case here in gold, which we do have. And you'll notice that by the year 2035, we are approaching 0.0% economic growth. Now, who is that good for? Is that even good for the food industry? Okay, that's where we're headed, because of this. So this, this uh, document, a 76-page document, was called The Bittersweet Aftertaste of Sugar. So the banks get it, but the doctors don't. You got it? Did you get it? So here's Credit Suisse again. Another report, again, clear eye. Okay? Their job, remember, is to make money, right? And they published this report in 2013, Sugar Consumption at a Crossroads, and this is what they said in that. We believe higher taxation on sugary food and drinks would be the best option to reduce sugar intake and help fund the fast-growing health care costs associated with type 2 diabetes and obesity. A global investment bank calling for taxation. Now, how effed up is that? But that's what we got. Well, in fact, San Francisco passed it on the second trial. But that's okay. All right? Now, Chicago just repealed theirs before they even implemented it. You know why? Because Chicago. Paid off. Because it's Chicago, right? They have a long history of payoffs, don't they? Going back a long way, indeed. Yes, that's what happened. They got paid off okay, by the American Beverage Association. Okay. Why? Why all of this? Well, for a couple of reasons. And it's on this slide. So this is from National Geographic in 2013. Sugar, why we can't resist it, indeed. We can't resist it. It's, it's a hedonic substance. And all hedonic substances and all hedonic behaviors have as their extreme addiction. Get closer to the mic. Sorry. Please. All hedonic substances and behaviors in their extreme lead to addiction. That's why they're hedonic. That's the definition. Okay. This is from two days ago. Okay. Trump declares opioid crisis a health emergency, but requests no funds. And Jeff Sessions says people should just say no. Oh, like it worked for Nancy Reagan, did it? Oh, yeah, okay. So we're going to declare an opioid crisis, but we're not going to put any money behind it. The question is, where did the opioid crisis come from? Anybody have any idea? Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. I'm going to play you a 30 second video that's going to change your mind. Okay, ready? I couldn't get through a day without doing something to alter my consciousness. And it started with heroin. It started, no, it started with sugar. Oh, yeah, when I was five, six years old, I was cramming sugar down my throat as fast as I could get it down. Sweets. You know, sugar on bread and butter. I became addicted to sugar because it changed the way I felt. It's Eric Clapton. Yeah. Eric Clapton talking about how he started his addiction cycle. He started with sugar. So, my question to you is, what are we doing to our children? Gateway drug. Sugar is a gateway drug. And we actually now have early data in animals 
that says that's exactly right. But we don't have human data yet. And I'm, I'm about the science, but we have animal data that actually supports that notion. We also now have data that shows that fructose crosses breast milk. So it may even be what the mother is drinking before the baby is even weaned. And we have this inconsistent data on breastfeeding and obesity. And maybe that's why. So we don't know yet. But am I worried about it? Uh, a little. You get the idea. Okay? I mean, play that out in your mind, you know. So, is there such a thing as processed food addiction? Well, a whole lot of pay books. You can buy them right here. <laughs> Susan, I'm sure you'll be happy to furnish everyone with a copy of every one of these, right? In fact, there's a textbook on food and addiction for exactly that reason. So, here's the hack. Okay? It starts here. Okay? This is where we got on. Everybody recognize this document? Yep. Okay. Every, everyone on the planet knows one phrase, one clause from this document, and it is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right? So, how do you think we're doing? Like Ed Koch would say, how am I doing? <laughs> how are we doing with life? <clears throat> Not so good. So here's the lifespan of everybody else in the world, and here's ours. Not so good. Here's U.S. life expectancy declines for the first time since 1993. So heart disease has actually gotten better, but diabetes has gotten so much worse as to basically overcome any effects of heart disease that might have been achieved with statins. Now, Angus Deaton, Nobel Prize winner, and his wife, Anne Case, looked at this decline and asked the question, okay, who's dying? And the answer is, not the Latinos, not the blacks. It's the United States whites. Here are all the other countries, and you can see that deaths per thousand are going down everywhere else. And for U.S. whites, it's going up. And when you look at what they're dying of, it's poisonings and suicides. It's the opioid epidemic. That's what it is. And yes, there's no question that the pharma companies have capitalized on this. And there are all sorts of things. And you've heard about all the uh, uh, legislation and the fact that, you know, uh, the, the guy who was going to be the... Uh, uh, head of the DEA had to withdraw because uh, Marino, because he had uh, he had actually put that uh, uh, bill forward that uh, exonerated these companies, etc. Okay, so here's illicit drug use in the United States: marijuana, hallucinogens, illicit drugs. You know, all going up. This is past month illicit drug use among adults, 50 to 64. Okay, middle-aged white people. Okay, look at what's going on. Okay. Here's overdoses from heroin and fentanyl. Here's from cocaine. Here's from benzos. <coughs> this one is really worrisome. This is alcohol in women. Okay? Not white males, white females. They're not taking opioids. They're drinking alcohol instead. Okay? You can see the women a two-fold increase, an 83.7% increase in 10 years, from 2001 to 2013. And when you look at who's drinking, it's not the teenagers. It's the adults. Why? Why is everybody now drug overdosed? What's going on? Clearly, something's not right. We are not very happy, are we? Now let's do liberty. So, anybody familiar with Raj Chetty? Very, very smart economist at Harvard. And he runs this Equality of Opportunity Project, which is how we figure out whether or not different sectors of society are being left behind, etc. Okay? And what you can see here is the predicted exposure 
based on uh, of uh, an income based on where you were born, where you were born. Okay, and what you can see is if you were born down in the southeast, you are making less than your parents. If you're out in here in California, it's kind of like half and half. Okay, but <coughs> let's look a little closer. Let's look at New York City. Okay, so over here we have the Bronx, and over here we have Bergen County. Take a look. If you were born in the Bronx, and this is adjusted for everything under the sun, okay, everything under the sun, and your parents are at the 25th percentile of income. If you were born in the Bronx, you have 10.89% lower income than if you were born in Bergen, unrelated to everything else, unrelated to race, unrelated to uh, education, unrelated to everything. Okay, huge difference just across the Hudson River. So you say, well, wait, that's just poor people. Let's look at the not-so-poor people. Let's look at the 75th percentile. Guess what? Still there. So you can't escape your birth. In fact, here are the top 10 counties where you can make more than your parents. And here are the bottom 10 counties where you're going to make less than your parents. Whatever you do, do not move to Baltimore. <laughs> Okay, you are screwed if you are in, from Baltimore. Okay, anybody been to Baltimore lately? I was just there. I took my kid to see Hopkins. She said, "I ain't going there." Okay. And finally, the pursuit of happiness. How are we doing on that? What do you think? So, let's look at some data. So here's children hospital admissions with a diagnosis of suicidal ideation over a 15-year period all going up in the pubertal age group. Not so much in the 5 to 11, but once you hit puberty, whew. And here's the encounters in the outpatient clinic with suicidal ideation or self-harm, tripling over this last seven years in clinic with you know, pubertal kids, tripling. Notice, this is suicides in children, OK? We're looking here at motor vehicle accidents deaths from motor vehicle accidents in the 10 to 14 year old age group going down. So you say that's good. You know why it's not good? Because, well, it's not that they, well, they never drove. But the, why is it bad that the motor vehicle accidents are going down in the 10 to 14 year old age group? Because why? Fewer of them left. Right, the, well, no, no, it's not because fewer of them left. It's because they're not leaving the house. Because they're playing video games or being texting on social media. So let's look instead at the suicides. And you'll notice that the suicides now outclass the motor vehicle accidents in terms of death. And here's antidepressant use in the United States from 1999 up to 2014. We're all on Prozac now. We're Prozac Nation. Indeed, we are. But it's not just us. It's the whole world. 322 million people diagnosed with depression globally, 4.4%. An 18.5% increase in prevalence over 10 years. So it's not just us. The whole world's depressed and very unhappy. And it's not because of Trump. It preceded him. I'm going to make the argument that we don't have four problems. We don't have a healthcare crisis, a social security crisis, an opioid crisis, and a depression crisis. I'm going to make the argument that we only have one, that these are four manifestations of the same crisis, and that that crisis is this, the systematic confusion and conflation of two terms, two positive emotions, two things you thought you knew, called pleasure and happiness. They're both good. They both feel good. Why should we care? What's the difference? Anybody want to give me the differences between pleasure and happiness? I think if Throw them out. Is something fleeting, whereas happiness is something more kind of like a, yeah, lasts longer. Okay. Pleasure is short lived, happiness is long lived. That's one. <laughs> Six more to go. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Come on. Come on. Intensity. Come on, this is San Francisco. Get with it. Intensity. Intensity. Nah. Huh? 
pleasure is sensory and ah. physical. Pleasure is visceral, you feel it in your body. <laughs> Happiness is ethereal, you feel it above the neck. Swear to God, I didn't pay these people. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure's more easily achieved. <laughs> Pleasure is taking. Happiness is giving. Pleasure is experienced alone. Happiness is usually experienced in social groups. Pleasure comes from outside. Happiness comes from inside. We're going there. Mm -hmm. Pleasure is achievable with substances. Happiness is not achievable with substances. The extremes of pleasure, whether it be substances or behaviors. So substances like cocaine, heroin, nicotine, alcohol, sugar, or behaviors. Shopping, internet, gambling, video games, porn. In the extreme, all lead to addiction. There's an addiction for every one of those. But there's no such thing as being addicted to too much happiness. And number seven, pleasure is dopamine and happiness is serotonin. Two different biochemicals, two different areas of the brain, two different sets of receptors, two different regulatory pathways. Like, who cares? God, they both feel good. Why should I give up? Here's why. Because dopamine is an excitatory neurotransmitter. It excites the next neuron. When it's released from one neuron, it crosses the synapse, the little cleft between neurons, and binds to receptors that are on the surface of the next neuron. And dopamine excites those. Okay? And when it does it in the reward center of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, which is where all reward is transduced, Every one of those substances and behaviors all go through that same reward pathway. There's no other way around, okay? It is one super highway of reward, okay? Long-term chronic overexcitement of neurons causes neuronal cell death. Neurons are fragile. You know, when people drown, the brain goes first, right? You know, the heart can keep beating for a long time, right? Brain goes first. It needs more uh, glucose, it needs more oxygen, because it doesn't have any place to store energy. And so neurons are very fragile. And so they like to be tickled. They don't like to be bludgeoned. Okay? And so chronic overstimulation of, uh, of the neuron in the nucleus accumbens by dopamine will lead to neuronal cell death. So that neuron, that second neuron, has a fail-safe, an uh, option B, a self-defense mechanism. What it does is it down-regulates the number of receptors on its surface so that when the dopamine is released, there won't be as many receptors to bind to, therefore the effect is lessened and so the neuron will fire less. Everybody got that? So what does it mean in human terms? Well, you get a hit, you get a rush, receptors go down, Next time you need a bigger hit to get the same rush and the receptors go down and then a bigger hit and a bigger hit and a bigger hit until finally you get a huge hit to get nothing. And that's called tolerance. And then when the neurons start to die, that's called addiction. Dopamine is the way you get addicted because the dopamine receptors go down. And here's an example. So here's a control brain and here are the dopamine receptors in the nucleus accumbens, and the red means there's a lot of them. Okay, that's control there. And here's a cocaine brain. Notice, way down. Everybody got it? Okay. Well, here's a control brain. Here's an obese brain. What do you see? Same phenomenon. In fact, we now have plenty of data to show that this is one of the reasons why obese people keep eating, is because they're not getting the reward from the food they ate because their receptors have been down-regulated. But on the converse, serotonin is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It doesn't excite the next neuron. It actually puts the next neuron to rest. So the concept of contentment, the concept of emotional well-being, the concept of happiness is due to suppression of a set of neurons that are serotonin regulated. And so 
those serotonin receptor neurons don't have to downregulate their receptors because they're not at risk because they're being put to rest, not oh, being overexcited. So there's no such thing as overdosing on too much happiness because you can't do it. Plus, it's an, on an auto servo mechanism like your thermostat in your house. So you never get too high and you never get too low unless you don't have any heat in the house in the first place, which can happen because you can lower the amount of serotonin in your brain through various maneuvers, which we're doing every day. It's called American life. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the dopamine system. Here's where it starts, here in the ventral tegmental area. That's where the uh, neurons uh, with, containing the dopamine are. And then over here is the nucleus accumbens. That's the reward center where this is transduced. And then there's this other area over here, which is very important, called the prefrontal cortex. Anybody ever heard of that? Okay, that's over here, right behind your forehead, above your eyes. Okay, it's the Jiminy Cricket part of your brain. Okay, it's the part of your brain that keeps you from doing stupid things. Okay, it's really important. It's the executive function part of your brain. And when, you, when it's not working, okay, you end up in jail. It's that simple, okay? Serotonin, you'll notice, starts in a different place. It starts down here at the dorsal raphane nucleus, so it's not the same place. It's a different chemical, different pathway, and it does innervate the prefrontal cortex too, but it innervates the entire brain, whereas the dopamine didn't. So you notice they're not the same pathways. Okay? And then there's even a third pathway that's important in this story, and it's called the stress-fear memory pathway. And so there are four structures in the brain here the amygdala over here, okay, which is a walnut-shaped organ on either side, which is your fear center. So like when you're walking down a you know, uh, street in South Chicago at 3 in the morning, okay, your amygdala is going, you know, like, <laughs> like that. Okay? The hippocampus is where your memories are stored. Okay? And your amygdala and your hippocampus are in reciprocal connection with each other. Okay? So like when you put your hand on the hot plate or on the stove when you were three years old, you never did it again, did you? Okay? And that's stored in the hippocampus. So the amygdala told the hippocampus what was going on, and so you ain't never doing that again. So when the system is working, it's all good. All right? But that's where that's stored. Okay? In addition, we have the hypothalamus, which is in control of stress and emotion and also this hormone called cortisol. And cortisol is super important in this story. That's the stress hormone that keeps your blood pressure up, your blood glucose up, and also makes you sick to your stomach when you're stressed. Okay? Well, here's the paradigm. This is the most important slide I will show you about the book. Here's dopamine over here. Here's the dopamine receptor. And you can see we've got this, oh, sorry, it's going this way. It's a vicious cycle. Okay, where dopamine gets released, the receptors go down, that's called tolerance. Okay? Throw a little stress on top and what happens is you disable the prefrontal cortex and then your reward system goes hog wild and that's called addiction. So that's addiction over here, is dopamine plus stress. That's addiction. Over this side we have serotonin. Okay? And what happens is that all of these things that cause dopamine to go up also cause serotonin to go down. Everything in our environment, technology, processed food, sugar, lack of sleep, drugs, all lead to dopamine going up, yet serotonin going down through this thing called metabolic syndrome. Then throw some stress on top of it, which downregulates the receptor for serotonin, a 1A receptor, which is the contentment receptor, and now you got depression. So addiction and depression are really just two sides of the same coin caused by the same <coughs> environmental insults thrown uh, with some stress thrown on top, which is what we've got 24-7. Everybody got that? So, to summarize, addiction is excess reward from too much dopamine because dopamine downregulates its receptors, then throws some stress on to increase the dopamine, which reduces the receptors even more, and you get the diminution of pleasure, which is what we have. And on depre the depression side, we have deficient contentment because of not enough serotonin. Metabolic syndrome downregulates serotonin. The stress reduces the serotonin receptors, so you get a diminution of happiness. So when it's all said and done, you get lack of both. And that's what we've got. 
addiction and depression. So that's the hack. The question is, who perpetrated the hack? How did it come about? Did it just come out of nowhere? In a vacuum? Just cause? Or was this planned? The answer is, this is industry driven. And I will show you how it's industry driven. And government sanctioned. It's willful. It's willful and well orchestrated and very specific. It's not a conspiracy. It is not a conspiracy because conspiracy would require collusion between industry actors specifically for corporate malfeasance. That's not what's going on. This is about money. It's not about anything else. And all of the industry actors are in competition with each other. They're not sharing their uh, plot with anyone else, but they all came up with the same plot because it works. <laughs> okay? So I'm not saying this is a conspiracy, but it doesn't matter, really, when it's, when it's all said and done. And it's been engineered specifically with a profit motive. So let's give you some examples in everyday life of things you know about that prove this point. How about this? Any happiness in that bottle? What's in that bottle? Sugar, that's reward. Caffeine, that's reward. Phosphoric acid leaches your bones. Caramel coloring causes wrinkles and cancer. Um, salt raises your blood pressure. Um, what else? Pleasure, well, yeah, so there's pleasure in the bottle, but any, any happiness in that bottle? This was the longest running campaign of the, uh, of, of the company's uh, tenure, uh, uh, 100 and whatever, 35 year history. How about this? Okay. This came out of the, um, uh, 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 this was in um, uh, the, the, what do you call it? It's the, you know, the stuff that comes in your mailbox that you junk hate? Mail. Junk mail. This came in the junk mail. The road to your happy place is paved with raisins and flakes. And pavement. And pavement. <laughs> so what are they saying there? Saying it's your fault. Because you didn't exercise. And pavement, right? I want you to look at those raisins. Those are raisins, right? Are those the raisins in Raisin Bran? Those are the raisins in Raisin Bran. They're white. Okay, see them? Okay. Now there's 16 grams of sugar. You know what? If you actually count the raisins, which I did, okay, in a cup of raisin bran, and you weigh them, okay, that's worth eight grams of sugar. So what's the other eight? It's the powdered sugar to make you eat it. Okay, and if you have raisin bran crunch instead, okay, we're up to twenty-nine grams of sugar. Okay, notice sugar is the second ingredient after the whole grain wheat, and there's brown sugar syrup, corn syrup, and honey as well. Duh. And molasses. Huh? Molasses, too. And the last one? Where? Molasses. Molasses, yeah. Well, that's a glucose. That's not fructose. Oh. Okay. This is really special. Okay? This is from Nestle. Okay? Choose <laughs> wellness. Okay? Wellness. Big, big term, right? Everybody using it? What does wellness mean? Anybody know? Nobody knows. Okay? And at UCSF, we don't even know either. And I was on the wellness committee. <laughs> Okay? Big joke. But this is what they said. Your well-being. <laughs> Studies show that happiness and health are intimately linked together. The healthier you are, the happier you'll be, and vice versa. I won't even argue that. There's actually some data that says that's not true. But you know what? I'll let it go. I'll let it go. <laughs> happiness comes from spending time with loved ones, fostering relationships, or learning how to cope with stress or depression. Totally agree. That's exactly right. They did get this right. So they actually understand this. Yet... This is the paper I was just referring to. Does happiness itself affect mortality? This is the UK Min Million Women Study. And what they showed was that self-rated poor health at baseline was associated with unhappiness. But when adjusted the tr for treatment, for, you know, for all those things, turns out that unhappiness was not associated with mortality from all causes. In other words, it's not the unhappiness that kills you. It's the bad behaviors you do because you're unhappy that kill you, okay? So they're saying happiness comes from spending time, which is true, but it's not the bad behavior. It's not the, the unhappiness, it's the bad behavior. And whose bad behavior, I mean, are they stoking? 
Nestle wants to sell you both sugary snacks and diabetes pills. They're getting into the diabetes pharma industry so they can give you a disease and treat it all at the same time. This is, no, this is well documented. How about, and, and, and they're exporting it around the world. This was in the New York Times, you may have seen. How big business got Brazil hooked on junk food. This, these are promotoras with, this is a Nestle cart, and they go around to all of the homes in their, these poor neighborhoods in order to make money selling soda. How about the Happy Meal? Not so happy, right? McDonald's distributes 1.5 billion toys worldwide, just not in San Francisco, right? Because we passed the toy ban. You know that after we passed the toy ban, three states passed bans on toy bans? <laughs> the NBA, the Olympics, Nick Jr., Barbie, Teletubbies, Transformers, Hello Kitty, Lego. Disney stopped, to their credit. The good news is there are fewer Happy Meals sold. The bad news is kids are ordering off the dollar menu instead. <laughs> How about Happy Hour? What do you think? It's 5 o'clock somewhere. Okay, It's 5 o'clock in the Solomon Islands right now. Okay. The question is, who's, where is it 5 o'clock every 10 a.m. on NBC? Oh. The Today Show Happy Hour, where Hoda and Kathy Lee drink at 10 a.m. Why do you think the alcohol consumption in women is up 83.7% in the adults who are staying home to watch? And even more pernicious and disgusting, Hoda has breast cancer. And alcohol causes breast cancer and recurrence. You okay with this? And finally, the piece de resistance, a video. You will enjoy this. Promise. <laughs> Wait for it, wait for it. <laughs> wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. product placement. Not so good for happiness. Red Bull, two candy bars and a bag of potato chips in South Central LA in a convenience store at midnight. He ain't going to sleep. <laughs> now how about adding some stress to the reward? Like Cialis. Are you ready? Will you be ready? Or how about more stress? Oh, come on, this is worth a laugh. <laughs> Three ways. Where was this at? Huh? Where was that at? Well, it, it, was in a, um, it was in a medical journal. Yeah. And sleep deprivation. We're familiar with the coffee and the computer. Okay, and the technology, which all of our kids are now addicted to, and there's data on that. Okay. In fact, um, Jean Twenge, who's a, um, a sociologist at Arizona State, wrote this, uh, Has Smartphones Destroyed a Generation? She has a book, I think, Susan, you have it, called iGen, around here somewhere. Okay. All right, talking about what's going on with cell phones. There was just an article in the New York Times, like on Sunday, about cell phone addiction. Okay. Point is, this is engineered. This is not by accident, and I can prove it. So this is the model. This is the four-compartment model. Nir Ayal, who is an internet entrepreneur down in Silicon Valley, wrote this book called Hook, How to Form Habit-Forming Products. You got that one too, Susan? Mm, maybe. Get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> so there are four parts. It starts with the trigger, which we can call the itch, okay? the proverbial itch. It's got to be something that's socially acceptable, like your email going off. That's an itch. Okay? And then it has to lead to an action, which also has to be socially acceptable. So like, you know, scratching your genitalia is not socially acceptable. But checking your email in public currently is still socially acceptable. Um, I think that we have to work on that, not have that. Okay? 
The third part is variable reward. It can't be the same every time. Who here uses GPS? Do you keep checking it? Because it's the same every time you look at it, right? Okay? But if it's not the same every time, like your Facebook likes, or your email, okay, or Groupon, or Overstock, you know, oh, and, and it's going to be gone in like, you know, the next 10 minutes? Or how about United Airlines? Did you ever notice? You log on, you look, check a fare, okay? You go away for 15 minutes to check to see if you uh, can actually make it. They come back, oh, fare gone! <laughs> right? Ever happened to you? You think that's by accident? And I'll prove it to you now. Okay, who here has, who uses Gmail? A lot of you. Yeah. It's free, right? Okay. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that when you open your email in Gmail, it takes about a second to two seconds for the new emails to populate? What do you think? Google's just slow? That's baked in. That's engineered. And the reason we know that is because Tristan Harris, former Google exec who left the company because of this, outed them on 60 Minutes and the PBS NewsHour in their own words. And he actually started a foundation to actually combat this abuse that we are actually uh, subject to through our technology. Okay? So there we are. Technology, processed food, sugar, sleep, lack of sleep, drugs, all contributing to upping your dopamine, downing your serotonin, addiction and depression, driving health care, social security, opioid crisis, depression crisis, all over the last 30 to 40 years. 40 years, really. Okay? So in summary, reward is not contentment and pleasure is not happiness. Reward is dopamine, contentment is serotonin. Chronic excess reward interferes with contentment, which is super important you get that. The more pleasure you seek, the less happy you get. And we're looking for reward all the time. Chronic stress drives reward at the expense of contentment. Business has intentionally conflated pleasure with happiness, specifically for you to buy their junk or engage in hedonic behaviors that are profitable to them. Government legislation and Supreme Court decisions, which we did not talk about because this was long enough, but it's in the book, okay, and I'd be happy to talk about it during question and answer, may have made it easier to buy that junk and engage in those behaviors very specifically and individuals and society become fat, sick, stupid, broke, addicted, depressed, and most decidedly unhappy. <laughs> so the question is, what can we do? And the answer is, a lot. You can do a lot. You can't fix society, but you can fix yourself, you can fix your home, you can fix your kids, you can fix your family. And if everybody did, we'd be all a whole lot happier. So I call these the four C's. You'll see why. They're all evidence-based. They're all clinically proven to work to up your serotonin, tamp down your dopamine, reduce your cortisol, improve happiness, <laughs> improve contentment and well-being, and most importantly, guaranteed or your money back. <laughs> but they don't cost anything, so don't expect a refund. <laughs> and they're all things your mother told you, but you forgot while you were texting, drinking a Coca-Cola. Okay? Here's the first one. Connect. Susan, you got Reclaiming Conversation? Uh, Very good book. I don't know. Very good book. Sherry Turkle, MIT media professor, okay, who coined the term alone together. That's what we are now. We are not connected. We, are, we have connectivity, but we don't have connection. So the question is, what does connect mean? It does not mean Facebook, that's for sure. <laughs> so, we have this thing in the world called religion. Who here is religious? Good, one. That's right. <laughs> Two, okay, fine. Do you know there were 4,200 religions on the planet? Now, if any of those religions were any better than any others, you think we'd have 4,200? <laughs> Every religion has one thing in common with all the others. Community. Face-to-face -face gathering. 
the gathering of people in the same house of worship, the same place. Okay, You don't practice your religion alone. You practice it with people. And the reason is because you have to look them in the eye. Because we have a set of mirror neurons in the back of our head, which are reading your, the person you're talking to's facial expressions in real time and analyzing them like a computer would. And you are adopting the emotions of the person you are talking to. And this is a process. We have a name for it. It's called empathy. This is empathy. And empathy is the increase in serotonin. Empathy is contentment. But you have to look somebody in the eye because you have to read their facial expressions. You know Paul Ekman, the Berkeley professor who went to Papua New Guinea, you know? I mean, these are people who've never seen white people or any other people, okay? And they have, they had, you know, their own language, but they all had the same facial expressions as every other culture because it's baked in. It's hardwired into our DNA that we all use the same, um, uh, same facial expressions to mean the same things. So we read those like a computer, okay? But on Facebook, can you do that? Can you have a relationship with anonymous? Do emojis convey empathy? <laughs> okay. What if you don't have empathy? What if you can't generate that serotonin? What do you have? You have something called psychopath. <laughs> That's what a psychopath is. Okay. Anybody know any psychopaths? Yes, <laughs> we all do. <laughs> Anybody know any in Washington? <laughs> Social media generates dopamine. In fact, religious fervor <clears throat> is dopamine. And the reason we know that is because Parkinson's patients who get L-dopa, the precursor to dopamine, back in the 1970s when we first started using it and didn't know the dosage, they would become compulsive gamblers or religious zealots. There's a whole literature on dopamine excess in Parkinson's patients because it hypes up the nucleus accumbens as well as the substantia nigra. So we actually know this is so. Facebook, however, does not yield serotonin. It yields dopamine. That like button, most dangerous button you can push. And it's on purpose. Because it's not about likes, it's about dislikes. Okay? And this is leading to emotional depression in teens, one of the reasons why suicides are so high. Okay? And Sherry Turkle said we are alone together. So we have to connect, real connection, but we're not doing that. Number two, contribute. Okay, so this is the purpose driven life, Rick Warren, okay? Doesn't have to be religious, you know, the point is contribution, but that means outside of yourself. It does not mean to your IRA, okay? <laughs> right? It means giving of yourself with no reward attached. That's contribution. So. Can you get contribution from your work? And the answer is yes, you can. <coughs> if you can see how your work affects others, and if your boss can see it too, then your work can satisfy his contribution. But what if you can't? And there are a lot of people who can't. Then there's volunteerism, there's altruism, there's philanthropy. You can pay someone else to do it for you. Okay? But it can't be for brownie points. It can't be for Boy Scout badges. Okay? That's reward. Everybody got the difference between the two? Okay? So padding your bank account is not contributing, okay? and lottery winners are not happy. Okay? Those who value financial success derive less contentment, but saving rather than spending increases happiness. And spending money on yourself increases pleasure, makes you a consumer rather than an individual. Spending money on others makes you an individual and increases happiness. And I already told you about these. Okay, number three, cope. Okay, Dalai Lama, art of happiness, right? So sleep deprivation is a disaster. It turns out 35% of uh, American adults get less than seven hours of sleep per night and 23% are clinical insomniacs. What do you think happens when you're sleep deprived? Your cortisol goes like that, okay, which makes you eat, makes you insulin resistant, gives you metabolic syndrome, reduces your cortisol, and puts your prefrontal cortex to sleep. It goes into suspended animation. So what happens to your reward system? It is now an overdrive. So sleep deprivation drives, shall we say, bad behavior. Okay, everybody got it? 
and caffeine only makes things worse. Multitasking, everybody prizes it. Everybody says, oh, you know, you gotta have multitaskers in, in your employee, right? Because, you know, they can do everything. Turns out only 2.5% of the country can actually multitask. The rest of everybody else is smoke and mirrors. It's serial unitasking. And every time you switch tasks, your cortisol goes up. So you're actually making yourself sick by conforming to this new cultural icon, you know, this, this new cultural ideal called multitasking, which we never had before. But we have to have it. But we don't have to have it. But we have to have it. But we really don't have to have it. You get the idea. Okay? Screens are the antithesis of sleep. The blue light plus, of course, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the interaction to keep kids awake. Kids who charge their cell phone in their room get 28 minutes less sleep per night than kids that charge their cell phone outside their room. Okay? They still have cell phones, but not in the room. And smartphone apps for wellness have not shown any benefit. <laughs> Anybody work for any app makers? 27,000 apps on the market for wellness and or physical fitness. None of them have been shown to work. None. Zero. Meta-analysis. Zero. Okay. Mindfulness. So, you know what mindfulness is? It's exercising your prefrontal cortex to be able to concentrate on one thing. One thing. And that actually is good for you. Okay? And that actually puts your dopamine down, makes your serotonin go up, improves metabolic health, alleviates depression, and exercise turns out to be as good as SSRIs at alleviating depression. Problem is, of course, getting someone who's depressed to exercise, <laughs> which is not easy. And finally, cook. And I don't specifically mean Oprah, but she did say food, health, health is happiness, so I you know, have to use that one. Okay. So there are three things in food that matter. Tryptophan. The rarest amino acid, okay, is found in eggs, mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. poultry, yeah. fish, <coughs> okay. Eggs, poultry, fish. Any of those in processed food? Not too much, right? Chicken McNuggets. Okay, chicken McNuggets. No, there's no chicken in chicken McNuggets. <laughs> it's a McFrankenstein creation. The judge said so, okay. So, no. So, lo, uh, so processed food is low tryptophan. Low omega-3 fatty acids, which are anti-inflammatory, turns out if you deprive mice or rats of uh, omega-3s, you get an inflammatory bouton around the synaptic terminal of the serotonin neurons, which makes it harder for the serotonin to actually get to its target. And when you give the omega-3s back, that inflammation goes away. So that's kind of cool. Um, and of course, high sugar because of the addiction and metabolic syndrome lowering serotonin and fiber. There's no fiber in processed food. That's the definition of processed food. It's fiberless food because you can't freeze fiber. Okay? One third of Americans do not know how to cook and if you don't know how to cook, you're hostage to the food industry for the rest of your life. So the real food movement is in high gear, especially here in San Francisco. I am proud to be part of it. Hopefully you are proud to be a beneficiary of it. Okay? Point is, processed food kills. Processed food is dangerous, but that's what the companies are selling. Companies who don't change will ultimately be left in the dust unless they buy up all the startups and kill them, which they are doing. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very watchful of this. Mm -hmm. Campbell's Soup broke with the Grocery Manufacturers Association of America mm -hmm. over this. So that's kind of interesting. We're going to have to watch and see what happens. Ultimately, sitting down and having a meal with your family is the single best thing you can do for yourself because it is connecting, it is contributing, it is coping, and it is cooking <laughs> all at the same time the question is who's doing it anybody in this room actually cook a meal and sit down with your family I got one that back there in the back oh okay all right here we go all right, a couple. this is the single most important thing you can do to rescue yourself your family hopefully your friends invite them over for dinner what can we do professionally so five modest proposals. Not so easy to do, but very effective as well. At UCSF, we have gotten rid of sugared sodas, the Healthy Beverage Initiative. If you come on campus, you cannot find a soda, a sugared soda. There's diet soda. We're, I'd like to get rid of those too, but you know, it takes a while. <coughs> Swedish Hospital in Seattle actually got rid of juice. How about that? 
Proposal number two, let's call type 2 diabetes what it really is. Processed food disease. <laughs> Nobody knows what diabetes even means. It's an Egyptian word, means siphon, because you're in the bathroom peeing your brains out. <laughs> Does anybody know that? No. Okay. Let's call it what it is. Plus, everybody gets type 1 and type 2 confused, and I've had death threats from type 1 parents because I didn't say type 2 in front of the diabetes, and they said, you're telling me I caused my child to have a disease. No, so let's give it a new name. Let's call it what it is, processed food disease. Oh, you have processed food disease. <laughs> Think you might learn something from that? Yeah. Teaching moment. Proposal number three, roll back the subsidies for processed food. Corn, wheat, soy, and sugar, all the things that are actually bad for us. These are all commodity crops. They make money. They trade them on the commodities exchange. Okay? That's why they are subsidized. They're all bad. Okay? There's not one in there that's good. But, you know, there's no economist on the planet who believes in food subsidies because they distort the market. Let the market work. Even the libertarians should be able to get behind that. In fact, the Giannini Foundation at, the, at UC Berkeley modeled what it would look like if we got rid of all food subsidies in the United States. And it turns out the only things that would go up are corn and sugar, which is actually kind of good. Yeah. Proposal number four, our Eat Real, this is our s label. If you see this in the window of a restaurant, it means whatever's in this restaurant can't kill you. <laughs> you know, some people would like to know that. Okay? And then maybe, you know, the competition across the street goes, well, you know, I'm losing business to them. Maybe I want to do that. And, you know, you raise everybody up, you know, through, um, you know, a grassroots approach. UCSF is real certified. Okay. There's a, I, I don't can see it, but it's, it's, it's over there. And proposal number five, let's get sugar off the FDA's generally recognized as safe list. Okay. Alcohol is not on it. Trans fats were taken off it. Nitrates were taken off it. Okay. Bottom line, sugar was not to, uh, meant to be used in the doses currently intended. That's the definition of generally recognized as safe, in doses currently uh, uh, intended. And that is not true. And if we took sugar off the grass list, then there would be an upper limit for any given food as to how much sugar the industry could put in. And if they wanted to put in more, they'd have to get a waiver. So that would, of its own necessity, bring consumption down to something that's more manageable. So with that, I will close. I hope you have learned something. I hope we've solved the healthcare crisis, solved the social security crisis, solved the opioid crisis, solved the depression crisis, and let's make America happy again. I'll be happy to take questions. We are running much Very later late. than Sorry. usual, so yeah. as much as I Wonderfest is known for its questions, I'm going to limit you to three, okay. and I want you to pick good people, I want the people to ask snappy questions, mm -hmm. I want you to repeat them, and I want you to give them snappy answers. You bet. All right. Uh, could you talk to the head of the San Francisco Unified School District? No. <laughs> anyway, We've tried. You've tried. Okay. We've tried. All right. Many he, times. He has a post to sugar, but he doesn't get it about saturated fat. It's It's been an ongoing disaster. Thank you for trying. We have tried. We are working on the Mount Diablo and the West Contra Costa school districts over on the other side in an attempt to try to bring San Francisco Unified along. Thank you so much. We, we're, we're working on it. Okay, but it's going to take an extra special hard push on this side of the bay. Great. You know, it's a problem. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of the nine children that you dealt with way back when, mm -hmm. and you took out the fructose, mm -hmm. but you added carbohydrates, yep. and I... Carbohydrates. Glucose. Prolimerized glucose. Starch. Starch turns to sugar. No, it doesn't. Starch turns to glucose. So this is oh, part so of the problem. This is part of, of the hacking. This is the hack. Because they have told you that starch turns to sugar. Starch turns to glucose. And that's better than fructose. Fructose, because of its stereochemistry, is seven times worse than glucose. And causes and goes straight to the liver and gets turned into liver fat. So the mm -hmm. food industry has several mantras. That's one of them. Starch gets turned into sugar. Not true. Second one, you need sugar to live. Well, you need a serum glucose to live, but you don't need dietary glucose to live because your liver turns protein and fat into glucose. It's called gluconeogenesis. So the Inuit 
You know, they ate whale blubber. They didn't have any place to grow carbohydrate all those years. The Eskimos had no cancer and no heart disease until we brought carbohydrate to them. Okay? They had a serum glucose. Okay? Even kids on a ketogenic diet have a serum glucose. So you don't need, you, you need glucose in your blood to live. You don't need dietary glucose to live, and you certainly don't need dietary sugar to live. Okay? Those are myths, and those are promulgated by the industry so that you will stay confused on purpose. And I'm trying to unconfuse you. And let's have a man. Yeah, okay. The relationship between serotonin and happiness. Why don't SSRIs make us all happy? Because there's a servo mechanism. You can't get too high. And also, um, it, th there's an autoreceptor. So you, it, it, it doesn't up the number. It reduces the clearance. So you can't go over. So the SSRIs are not a mode. It's, it's a mode of treating depression, but it's not a, not a mode of being able to up the serotonin to give you happiness. But they do increase serotonin levels. They increase serotonin in the synapse, which is what alleviates the depression. Except that in and it's, remember, it's contentment that we're talking about, which is the baseline level of happiness, which is mediated through the 1A receptor. There are other things. I mean, there's joy, there's elation, there's rapture. You know, there are lots of different, you know, qualifications on this concept of happiness. I'm uh, defining it very specifically in the book and here through Aristotle's eudaimonia, which is emotional well-being, which is serotonin binding to the serotonin 1A receptor to lead to contentment. That's why I keep using that word contentment. But it is the baseline level of happiness. Did you ever see the movie Lovers and Other Strangers? Okay. Um, uh, the, the, the son asks um, Beatrice Arthur and Richard Castellano, the, the, the parents, you know, are, you, are you guys happy? And uh, Beatrice Arthur looks at him and says, Happy? Who's happy? <laughs> and he says, we're content. <laughs> we're content. That's exactly right. That, that, that's the level we're talking about. We're content. Okay? In other words, we have emotional well-being. Okay? We're not too high. We're not too low. And you know, we can get on with our lives and feel good about it. All right. Thank you.